Um, so, so hi, I'm Ryan Platt. I teach performance studies. Um, I have a special interest in movement and media, and um, this is um, part of a this is a first attempt, a first foray in into sound, and an attempt to um, to explore its possibilities within a larger project that identifies um, the presence um, processes of media and performance that um, interfere with visual mediacy and. Um, and, and challenge the, the predominance of the of theater or the theatron as a place from which to see. Um, and that, for that process of challenging theater as a place from which to see really led me to sound. Um, so this feels very new. Um, and as something of an outsider, I thought it would seem opportune to begin in a properly impious way with an image. An image, that is, of the inner ear. Sound artist Jakob Kierkegaard uses this image of the inner ear as the icon for his 2008 installation, Labyrinthitis, and places it on the cover of Ear Side Out, the catalog for documenting his recent mid-career retrospective held at the Museum for Contemporary Art in Roskilde, Denmark. Suspended in abstract space and devoid of clinical explanation, Kierkegaard's inner ear makes for an odd image. Although anatomically correct, it sits at one side at an unrealistic angle that reinforces its distance from the body and suggests the suspension of its biological function. This strange state of suspension is consistent with Kierkegaard's installation, Labyrinthitis. As suggested by referring to a vertigo-inducing disease, Labyrinthitis disorients its audience in order to contest the assumption that hearing is a passive process in which the inner ear functions as a neutral conduit for communication, little different than a microphone. As Kierkegaard demonstrates in Labyrinthitis, however, the ear has a life of its own. Throughout his installations, Kierkegaard pursues this oddly inanimate life in the overlooked, on the overlooked objects that support urban, ar ar excuse me, urban infrastructure. Pipes in the London Underground, concrete columns, iron fences lining city bridges, and into remote and abandoned locations unfit for human habitation. He visits volcanic geysers, Arctic, gla uh, Arctic glaciers, and the Arabian desert, as well as Fukushima's irradiated landscapes, decrepit buildings in Chernobyl, and the no man's land that surrounds the Israeli West Bank barrier. As has become common in sound art, Kierkegaard amplifies neglected oral phenomena in these inhospitable spaces and arguably connects audiences to the multiplicity of life from beyond the purview of the human subject. To some extent, it is possible to interpret Kierkegaard's installations as an affirmation of such multiplicities. But by dwelling in sites of catastrophe, they also impart the precarity of life and the urgent needs for alternatives to the instrumental logic that defines energy, nature, and technology. In this paper, I intend to examine how Kierkegaard's installations, and by and large labyrinthitis, challenge instrumental concepts of technology by developing an aesthetic process based not on mechanical devices, but rather on a particular mechanical principle, the automaticity of automated motion. The emergence of this automated motion in labyrinthitis can be traced to its material, which consists exclusively of autoacoustic emissions. Autoacoustic emissions are scarcely audible, high-pitched tones produced by the inner ear. To be more specific, they occur in response to the collective oscillation of the cochlea's outer hair cells, which increase frequency selectivity and amplify incoming sound. In order to make an optimal state for the reception of sound, this amplification sometimes occurs in the absence of external stimuli and produces spontaneous autoacoustic emissions, which vary in pitch, volume, and number according to the individual. We all have different autoacoustic emissions, as it turns out, which is kind of interesting. Uh, for Kierkegaard, the discovery of autoacoustic emissions was a revelation. He tried to record them, but to his surprise and disappointment, it turned out that his ears do not emit auto spontaneous autoacoustic emissions at all. As a result, he instead recorded a different type of autoacoustic emission that occurs 
when the hair cells are stimulated in certain ways that make them emit tones, such as in the, as in the common infant hearing test that uses two pure tones played at a precise frequency ratio to generate a third tone known as a distortion product photoacoustic emission. This process informs the structure and material of labyrinthitis, which consists solely of recordings of Kierkegaard's distortion product autoacoustic emissions, um, which are played one at a time, moving down a standard scale. By tuning these emissions to a precise frequency ratio, they in turn, ter they in turn catalyze similar tones in audiences. This technique yields the fundamental innovation of labyrinthitis, which enables listeners to hear both the actual sounds of Kierkegaard's ears and their own autoacoustic auto emissions. In essence, to listen to labyrinthitis is to hear your hearing along with his as it is happening. And this seems like the one place that's really appropriate. Oh, no, for a brief excerpt. of hearing hearing has significant consequences for critical approaches to labyrinthitis, especially as pertains to its historical precedence. In an insightful review of labyrinthitis, poet and essayist Manuel Arturo Abreu argues that Kierkegaard's use of actual sounds from the inner ear belong to a materialist tradition that includes John Cage. In a manner reminiscent of Kierkegaard, Cage famously claimed while in an anechoic chamber to have heard the sound of his blood and nervous system. Although this attribution is likely erroneous, it accurately reflects one of Cage's underlying aesthetic principles, which maintains the ubiquity of sound. This attitude is a powerful affirmation of the infinite variety of phenomena from everyday life. Furthermore, the capacity to appreciate and perceive this multiplicity relates to a fundamental change in the signifying process, which ceases to depend on symbolic order. Abreu attributes this suspension of symbolic order to the use of actual sounds by this materialist tradition, which, in his words, eschews representation and uses sound not as symbol, but intervention. In this way, Kierkegaard's use of, of actual sounds from the body, body arguably has a decisive impact on the signifying process in labyrinthitis. In her seminal essay, Notes on the Index, 70s, Arts in, uh, 70s Art in America, Rosalind Krauss addresses a similar effect on signification in reference to another artist, choreographer Deborah Hay. And if you don't know, there's actually a direct link between, um, between Cage and Hay. So this is quite relevant. Um, like Cage's account of being in an anechoic chamber, Hay made a series of solos during the 70s in which she did not dance and explained to her audience that her body's cells were perpetually in motion. In her, anal hey, um, in her analysis, Krauss argues that the presentation of this incessant cellular motion does not function according to symbolic representation. By not dancing, Krauss, Krauss maintains that Hay breaks with the signifying process uh, conventionally employed in <coughs> dance, which uses movement to produce signs and establishes meaning by placing these signs in relation to one another and in correlation to a tradition of possible signs. The absence of this interrelated system causes a fundamental alteration in the nature of the sign, which ceases to function symbolically when movement, is um, when movement is understood as something the body does not produce and is instead a circumstance that is registered on it or within it, as appears to be the case in labyrinthitis. As indicated in her essay's title, Krauss claims that Hay's artistic approach dispenses with symbols and adopts another type of sign first postulated by C.S. Pierce, the index. In contrast to the representational function of symbols, 
Krauss explains that an index signifies by means of direct physical contact with its referent. She cites Pierce's example of a weather vane registering the wind and defines the index as the physical manifestation of a cause and adds that it resembles a trace. Following this logic, Hayes dance relays the trace of the body's life derived from the presence of actual physical phenomena, which in this case is cellular motion. It is, however, important to acknowledge that Krauss criticizes Hay. For Krauss, Hay's presentation of the unbroken continuity of her body's cellular motion is a fantasy that conveys a message of pure presence. Instead of pure or immediate presence, Krauss emphasizes that the index always points towards the actual instance of contact with its referent, which resides in the past. As such, it functions according to one of Pierce's main examples, a photograph. This formal affinity between indexical signification and photographic mediation is Krauss's main claim. According to her argument, the process of photographic mediation is inherent to indexical signification and originates in Marcel Duchamp's innovative use of the ready-made. For Krauss, the ready-made closely relates to the photograph because its process of production results from a defining moment of isolation from the continuum of reality. Labyrinthitis also imparts a process of mediation, but in a different way. Although labyrinthitis uses actual sounds, Kierkegaard arranges them into a composition. As a composition, it differs from a ready-made and therefore does not conform to photographic mediation, which depends on the isolation of something from within the succession of temporality. In this regard, it is significant that Abreu also traces Kierkegaard's techniques to another form invented by Duchamp, the roto-relief. There's some roto-reliefs. Um, in anemic cinema, roto-reliefs created contrast between a static disc and a moving disc to produce a visual oscillation. This oscillation makes it possible to look at the mechanism of seeing and thus resembles labyrinthitis, which is of course about hearing, hearing. In contrast to the ready-made, anemic cinema operates by means of the continual motion of this oscillation that reflects the process of perception. Rather than a ready-made, this motion links the roto-relief to cinema, which integrates the photograph's moment of isolation into this incessant succession of the film frame. However, the motion of roto-release does not stand up to the illusory capacity of cinematic motion and is thus, to riff on Duchamp's title, anemic. Like, ane like labyrinthitis, anemia in advanced stages literally causes imbalance, which relates to the artistic goal of anemic cinema, to present the incessant activity of visual perception. This continually automated motion is essential to labyrinthitis. In literal terms, it informs Kierkegaard's design for the installation, which resembles the cochleus spiral shape and forms a continuous curve. The continuously resolving pattern that characterizes this spiral is also intrinsic to Kierkegaard's use of photoacoustic emissions. Due to their precise tuning, these emissions automatically produce related tones in the audience's ears. As a series of physically related tones, they are not separate units or signs and so form a continuous chain. Furthermore, this chain consists of tonal pairs that proceed one at a time, patiently descending down a scale from high to low. In the absence of simultaneity, there is no opportunity for conflict between them. Likewise, the strange character of their pitch, um, likewise, the strange character of their pitch, pitch does not produce disruptive noise. As Douglas Kahn observes in an essay about, in a short essay about labyrinthitis, the ear sounds we hear in labyrinthitis lack the timbre that once could have associated them with modernist notions of musical noise. This absence of simultaneity and conflict in labyrinthitis is necessary to hear one's own odoacoustic emissions, which are singular to each individual body. As a result, the sounds in labyrinthitis remain singular, 
even while in ceaselessly automated succession. Ultimately, the singular nature of these successive sounds is crucial to the signifying process in Labyrinthitis. As singularities, they do not establish an ensemble of interrelated signs, which Krauss describes in her analysis of the index as the basis for symbolic order. Like the index, Labyrinthitis resists symbolic signification, but in a different way. Instead of a single instant of actual contact, the motion catalyzed by Kierkegaard's use of autoacoustic emissions sustains representational continuity. In addition to these physical and formal elements, the automated motion of autoacoustic emissions relates to one of Labyrinthitis' central premises, which challenges the assumption that the sense of hearing is passive. As Kahn explains, conventional definitions of hearing presume that sound follows a one-way route of transduction in which vibrations are sucked into the skull and transformed into electrical impulses to be released through the mouth or into gestures. Stated otherwise, upon completing its journey through the ear, the raw material of sound turns into meaningful words, words or actions, that is, words or actions that signify. In this way, the model of passive hearing described by Kahn adheres to the expressive function of symbolic language, which follows a direct route from its point of origin in the mind of the speaker to an external recipient. In this one-way passage, language moves through a medium that is supposedly separate from content. In this model, it is imperative wall on route to minimize any interference caused by the medium, which ideally should disappear without a trace. Labyrinthitis, however, does not follow a system of sy symbolic signification or the linear movement of meaning that pertains to it. According to Kahn, Labyrinthitis demonstrates that two-way traffic happens in the ear and thus exemplifies what he calls active hearing. As a two-way process, Kahn's model of active hearing is consistent with automated motion in Labyrinthitis, which initiates a continuous exchange with its audience and imparts the incessant activity of the auditory apparatus. This motion makes it possible to perceive that the ear is more than an inanimate conduit that relays information to the brain as if a tool. Hence, Kahn too argues that active hearing reroutes relationships among technology, nature, and the body and forms what he calls an actual circuit that suspends the oppositions between them. Once understood as a mechanical principle and not a tool, the body's auditory apparatus no longer conforms to an instrumental definition of technology, which uses objects as means to an end. Accordingly, the process of aesthetic mediation in labyrinthitis has no end and initiates a signifying system predicated on automated motion, which is ongoing, indefinite, and without either destination or origin. The suspension, this suspension of instrumental order also has important consequences for the material and temporal dimensions of labyrinthitis. If not applied to an end, it follows that a medium of communication must remain physically intact and therefore interferes with the communication of content. Interference, however, does not necessarily mean disruption. Like the inner ear, the medium becomes inseparable from content and literally part of it. In labyrinthitis, this inseparability relates to the presence of autoacoustic emissions, which are auditory artifacts that Kierkegaard allows to remain. They are material remainders that remind audiences of the mechanical process of mediation occurring within them, even now. This material remind remainder also affects visual aspects of Kierkegaard's installations. This is where I'm drawing towards conclusions. Um, including, which include, which frequently depict surfaces of separation, including metal plates, fog, fences, walls, and in uninhabited landscapes. Despite their apparent stasis, a multitude of minute movements traverse these inanimate objects and landscapes. As in labyrinthitis, this motion makes it possible to perceive the mechanical process of the body's perceptual apparatus, which is not erased 
but remains as a physical surface of separation, a separation that paradoxically provides a connection to that which is apart from it. As a mechanical principle, automated motion in Kierkegaard's installations challenges the instrumental logic that dictates conventional definitions of both technology and the human. Instead of being put to the service and put to use in the service of some end, this motion generates impassive mute material, like Kierkegaard's odd image of the inner ear with which I began, that has no practical application or purpose. As an embodiment of such senseless matter, Labyrinthitis ultimately asks audiences to regard art and performance differently, not as a vehicle for an immediate truth that may be understood, but as singular instances that are mediated and thus require time, time for nothing in particular, without an end in sight, and which ends disappear as if being subsumed beneath the snow that covers the toxic ground in Fukushima. Thank you for your time. Thank you.